So in December of last year, I had an article published in the academic journal called The Global Anglican, which used to be known as The Churchman. And this article, which you can access below in the description, I have a link there, looks at what for many people is a confusing subject, which is how the Anglican formularies understand the Apocrypha. Those are the books of the Bible that are sometimes called the Deuterocanon that Protestants do not believe are inspired scripture. However, Roman Catholics, for instance, believe that they are inspired scripture. But exactly what the Anglican formularies understand those books to be can be confusing. And this article looks at that issue and tries to essentially settle the score as to what the earliest Anglicans, both as expressed in the formularies, but also expressed in their own writings, what those Anglicans thought the Apocrypha are. So this video is just going to summarize this article so that you can have an overview of what the Anglican understanding of the Apocrypha is. We're going to look at three things. We'll look at how the Apocrypha is used in the Book of Common Prayer and the life of the Church of England. We're then going to look at what the earliest Anglican divines said about the Apocrypha, how they described it. And then finally, we'll look at the thorny issue of how the Apocrypha are described in the books of homilies and whether or not the homilies contradict what the other formularies say about the Apocrypha. So first of all, in terms of how the Apocrypha is actually used in the life of the Church of England during its earliest centuries, well, in the Book of Common Prayer, we have what's called the lectionary, which is a calendar of Bible readings for the year. And in that lectionary, the books of the Apocrypha are there and they are appointed to be read along with the other books of the Old Testament. And the lectionary never makes a distinction between the Apocrypha and the other books of the Old Testament. So if you didn't know that those books were apocryphal, just, just simply looking at the lectionary, you would just assume that they are part of the Old Testament. I'm going to quote now from my article itself. In all versions of the Book of Common Prayer, Chronicles and the Song of Solomon are never read. Those are canonical books of the Old Testament. And few of the Old Testament books are read in their entirety. For example, only nine of Ezekiel's 48 chapters are read. Meanwhile, the apocryphal books of Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Baruch, and Ecclesiasticus, which is 51 chapters long, are read in their entirety. If anything, then the Apocrypha appears to have a privileged place in the Book of Common Prayer's lectionary. In the 1662 edition of the Book of Common Prayer, from the 27th of September until the 23rd of November, all of the Old Testament lessons are from the Apocrypha. And seven chapters of Wisdom of Solomon and 18 chapters of Ecclesiasticus are read twice a year as they are appointed to be read again on Holy Days. Therefore, 22% of all Old Testament lessons, 83 days a year, are from the Apocrypha, which only make up roughly 13% of the Old Testament if they are included within it. The Apocrypha are therefore represented disproportionately high in the Book of Common Prayer's lectionary. So there are books of the Apocrypha that are favored much more highly than even key Old Testament books like the book of Ezekiel. And that does tell us something. It definitely suggests that the Anglican formularies do not view the Apocrypha as being just like any other human writing or any other, you know, fantastic theological writing even, since the lectionary only appoints books from the Bible. And yet there is the Apocrypha. So when we're going to get to how the Anglican writers and divines and theologians describe the Apocrypha, bear this in mind because they are writing in the context of a church life where throughout the year you are actually reading the Apocrypha as though they were books of the Old Testament. And when it comes to the authorized Bibles of the Church of England, such as, for instance, the King James Version of the Bible, those versions always included the apocryphal books within them. And in 1615, at a time when the Puritans were increasingly preferring to have their Bibles not include the apocryphal books, the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, actually forbade anyone to print a Bible without the apocrypha, with the penalty being one year's imprisonment if you did so. 
The Calvinist Archbishop of Canterbury, John Whitgift, also famously rebuked and chastised the Puritans for not believing that the Apocrypha should be included in the Bible. So there was definitely an Anglican understanding that the Bible is actually not complete if it doesn't include the books of the Apocrypha, which therefore means that just how the lectionary treats the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha were understood to in some sense be a part of the Bible. So now we'll look at how the Anglican theologians described the apocryphal books. And the first place to start would be Article 6 in the 39 Articles of Religion, which says this. In the name of Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. And, and by canonical books, they mean the 66 books of the Protestant canon. But then it says this. And the other books... As Jerome saith, the church doth read for example of life and instruction of manners, and yet doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. So there's a few important things to note here. First of all, the apocryphal books are not canonical, and that means that they are not the standard of truth. There's two senses of the word canonical, which we'll get to, but how the article uses the word canonical is standard of truth. So it's from the Greek word, which sort of means like a measuring rod. It's how you judge things. So the Apocrypha are not canonical books. In that sense, they do not have authority over religious matters or like theology and doctrine. However, the article's wording is quite interesting because it says of the Apocrypha, the other books. So when you read the article altogether, it looks like it's saying the Apocrypha are actually part of Holy Scripture. So I'll read it again. It says, In the name of the Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament, dot, 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 and the other books, as Jerome saith, the church doth read, for example, of life. So when it says other, that suggests that in the name of Holy Scripture, we do understand both the canonical books, the Old and New Testament, and the other books, that being the Apocrypha. Now, that might sound like a stretch, but when we actually get to the writings of the key Anglican theologians of the first hundred years of Anglicanism, you'll see that they actually do have this belief that the Apocrypha are part of the Bible, can in some instances be called scripture, and yet are not canonical scripture. But before we get into them, it's important to note that the Anglican divines believe that their understanding of the Apocrypha was actually the patristic understanding of the Apocrypha, which indeed it was. So for instance, St. Athanasius, we see this in his Festal Letter, and Jerome famously also had this distinction. I also have an interview with the Eastern Orthodox apologist Craig Truglia, which I'll link in the description below, where Craig even goes into how even throughout the Middle Ages, the Orthodox theologians believed that the Apocrypha were in some sense lesser than the other books of the Bible, and, and some of them believe the Apocrypha weren't inspired but should be included in the Bible and that sort of thing. So I actually believe that the Anglican's position on the Apocrypha is the patristic view and is even the view of many medieval theologians as well. And if you want a fantastic book that argues for that, I'm going to talk about that book in just a moment because it's going to come up in this discussion. So now we're just going to look at what three of the key Anglican divines said about the Apocrypha during the first 100 years of Anglicanism. But bear in mind that my article looks at what much more Anglican divines said about the Apocrypha and goes into their writings in much greater detail. This video is just a summary of my article. So first of all, the famous Anglican theologian Richard Hooker. In his magisterial book, The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, he does discuss the Apocrypha. First of all, he differentiates the Apocrypha from what he calls scripture, because the scripture for Hooker, uh, the books that are supernaturally authored by God, whereas the Apocrypha are what he calls, quote, human compositions. However, Hooker says that while the Apocrypha are not scripture, they are nevertheless, quote, annexed unto the Old Testament, end quote. He says they're read in church along with the scriptures. And then Hooker even says that the Apocrypha can be described as holy books, sacred books, and divine books. And he says the reason why we can call them divine, even though they're not divinely authored or divinely inspired, is because of two things. One is because of their excellent quality. Now, there's, this is, gets to something that can be confusing for some people, which is that we can describe something as being inspired by God, 
without saying that it's scripture. So for instance, you could say if you hear an amazing sermon, I mean, one of my favorite preachers was R.C. Sproul, and you hear some of his sermons and you think this guy is inspired by the Holy Spirit. You can you can just tell that that's what's happened. Or you listen to a beautiful piece of music, like some of Bach's compositions, and you think this guy was clearly inspired by the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that you're actually saying that these sermons or these pieces of music are inspired like the Holy Scriptures are. The Holy Scriptures are inspired in such a way that when you read them, that is God's direct word to you. That's not what we mean about things that we say. Inspired in the sense of the the fact that their quality is so high. And so Richard Hooker says that the Apocrypha have divine excellency, but they're not inspired by God in the sense that it's God's word breathed out for us as the infallible standard of truth. So that's one sense of the word divine. You could just say they're divine, as in they're so amazing. But the other reason why Hooker says you can call them divine is because he says that the subject whereof are sundry divine matters. As in the Apocrypha tells us about salvation history, about God's actions in history. They tell us about God, and that's another sense why we can call them divine. So William Whittaker in his fantastic 1588 masterpiece, Disputation of Holy Scripture, which is, by the way, a wonderful book for defending Sola Scriptura, he says that while the Apocrypha are not canonical in the strict sense, they are nevertheless, quote, received into the canon of the Bible. And this takes us to the distinction between the word canonical and the word canon. So this Greek word canon can actually mean two things. It can mean a list or it can mean a rule. And how the Anglican divines will use this word is when they say the word canon, they mean that as list. So if you say the canon of scripture, you mean the list of books of scripture or the canon of the Bible. That's the list of books in the Bible. When they use the word canonical, they mean that as rule or standard. It's the, it's the measure of truth, and only the 66 books of the Protestant canon are canonical because only they are inspired by God and are thus infallible, and so can infallibly determine and judge the truth. However, when they use the word canon, they include the apocrypha in that word. So the apocrypha are part of the canon of the Bible, but are not canonical because those are two different senses of that word. It's quite confusing, but again, this is actually patristic language where many church fathers actually utilize those words in those different ways. And now we come to Bishop John Cosin, who in 1657 wrote this masterpiece called A Scholastical History of the Canon of Holy Scripture. And in this book, he argues for the Anglican understanding of the canon. He argues for the accuracy of the New Testament canon and how we can have certainty in that canon. He argues for the accuracy of the Hebrew Old Testament, how we can have certainty in that. And then he also argues extensively for how we should view the apocryphal books as both being a part of the Bible and as being not inspired. And he copiously quotes from church fathers and medieval theologians to to show that that view was actually the majority view of most of church history, with key theologians like, for instance, Athanasius and Jerome holding to that view. Now, Cosin describes the canonical books of Scripture as being those that have, quote, their prime and sovereign authority from God himself, by whose divine will and inspiration they were first written, to be the infallible rule of our faith. So canonical means infallible rule of our faith because they were inspired by God. Cosin then says the apocryphal books are ecclesiastical rather than canonical. The reason why is because the canonical books are established by God. God has established and instituted those books as the infallible rule of faith and standard of truth for our lives. Whereas the apocryphal books are ecclesiastical because the church herself has essentially bestowed authority on those books. The church herself says, these are the books that you should read for instruction of life and manners. And then Cosin says that the apocryphal books are admitted into the canon of the Bible. So they're not canonical, but they're admitted into the canon of the Bible. They're in the list of books of the Bible while not being canonical because they're not the infallible standard of truth. And so Cosin says very clearly, quote, some books of the Bible there are 
which be not canonical. And like Richard Hooker before him, John Cosin says that while the Apocrypha are not divinely inspired, they may be called divine because they treateth of divine matters. They tell us about God's actions in history, particularly with the books of Maccabees, for instance, and how chapter two of Wisdom of Solomon has a prophecy of Jesus Christ in it. Cosin again says the Apocryphal books are included into the volume of the Bible because of the many excellent precepts and examples of life that be in them and for the better knowledge of the history and estate of God's people. And here's two more quotes from John Cosin. He says, there are certain books annexed to the Bible that bear the name and venerable title of divine scriptures, which yet ought to be distinguished from them as not having the same essentials, approbation, and authority that the genuine and canonical books have. This is a sort of confusing quote. He says that the Apocrypha bear the name of divine scripture, but are to be distinguished from divine scripture. An analogy to help you understand this is it's like how if you have an adoptive mother. She's not really your mother in the sense that she's not actually your biological mother, but you can still call her your mother because she is in the role of your mother. And similarly with the apocryphal books, they aren't scripture in the sense that they're not the holy writings divinely breathed out by the Holy Spirit. But if the church reads them for instruction of life and manners, reads them in the liturgy, is in the lectionary, you can sort of ascribe that title to them because they're sort of acting in that role when it comes to morals, but not when it comes to doctrine. So Cosin and Hooker and also William Whitaker all say that the apocryphal books have authority in moral issues, but not in doctrinal issues. And finally, John Cosin says, we may reckon the apocrypha likewise among the sacred scriptures, as we in the Church of England and other Reformed churches do at this day without allowing them the same honor and authority that the scriptures themselves have, which we only acknowledge to have been written by the prophets and apostles, as they were infallibly directed by the Holy Ghost. So then how the Apocrypha are used in the lectionary, how they're used in the English Bibles like the KJV, and how they're described by all the key Anglican divines, again, remembering that my article goes into much more of those divines, it actually is all perfectly harmonious. They believe that the Apocrypha are included in the Bible, are considered part of the Bible, are in the canon of Scripture, but are not themselves canonical because they're not directly inspired by God. The reason why they're included in the Bible is simply because of their important place in salvation history. So for instance, the book of Maccabees fulfills prophecies that we find in Daniel chapter 7. The Apocrypha fills the gap between the end of the Hebrew Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, what happened to the Jews during this span of time? And the Maccabees, for instance, tell us about that. When we get to the New Testament, Jesus celebrates the festival of Hanukkah, which is about the Maccabean revolt. And also when we get to the New Testament, people are being demonically possessed, which is not something that we actually find in the Hebrew scriptures, but it is something that we find, for instance, in the book of Tobit. So there's lots of gaps that get filled by the Apocrypha. And also while the Apocrypha are not breathed out by the Holy Spirit like the canonical scriptures are in the sense that they are the direct word of God, they are inspired in the sense of their excellency, their quality, and that sort of thing. So now we're going to look at what the Anglican homilies say about the Apocrypha. Now, some people argue that the homilies actually contradict Article 6 and some of the other Anglican theologians and actually just flat out declare the apocryphal books to be canonical scripture. Now, strictly speaking, some of the homilies actually do do this. They very clearly do describe the apocryphal books as canonical scripture. The issue with the homilies, however, is that not all of the homilies were actually written by people who we would consider to be Anglicans. In the first book of homilies, many of those homilies were written by Roman Catholics. The only difference being that these are Roman Catholics who didn't believe in papal supremacy. So for instance, men like Stephen Gardner, he was very much a Roman Catholic in his theology, his outlook on everything, with the one caveat that he did believe that the King of England was more autonomous than the Bishop of Rome thought he was. And so people like that shouldn't really be described as Anglican, and they shouldn't really be considered as authorities over what the Anglican view of the Apocrypha are. 
So for instance, in the homily of the misery of all mankind, it says, quote, the Holy Ghost in writing the Holy Scripture is nothing more diligent than to pull down man's vain glory and pride. And he then says, and we read that Judith, Esther, Job, and Jeremiah with other holy men and women in the Old Testament did so and so forth. So the point is, is that he does clearly include Judith among the books that are written by the Holy Ghost in writing the Holy Scriptures. That does seem to be canonical. The problem, however, is that this homily was written by John Harpsfeld, who was a devout Roman Catholic, with, again, the caveat being that he did believe that Henry VIII sort of had the right to disobey the Pope. But you, you can't consider this guy to be an Anglican, really, in any sense. And so what he says about the book of Judith in this homily I don't think that we should be using that to then determine what Anglicans should believe about the Apocrypha. Another example is the homily and exhortation concerning good order and obedience to rulers and magistrates. Because after it quotes from the Book of Wisdom, it then says, Let us learn also here by the infallible and undeceivable word of God that Dot, dot, dot. So the homily clearly says that the book of wisdom is the infallible and undeceivable word of God. In other words, it is canonical scripture. The thing with this homily, though, is that we don't actually know who wrote it. But I argue in my article that it was probably written by a Catholic. Reason being that there's no clear evangelical or Protestant ideas in this article at all. And I actually believe that Stephen Gardiner probably wrote this article. Now, Stephen Gardiner is a very famous figure in early Anglican history. And he was, again, one of these Roman Catholics who sided with Henry VIII during the split with the Pope. But he was very, very viciously opposed to Thomas Cremner and his reforms in the Church of England. And he himself actually approved of Thomas Cramner's execution, along with the execution of Bishop Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. So this guy should not be considered to be an Anglican, much less an authority over what Anglicans today should believe, considering that he approved of the judicial murder of Thomas Cramner, who wrote the Book of Common Prayer, the 39 Articles of Religion, the Ordinal, and most of the first book of homilies. Now, why do I believe that Stephen Gardiner wrote this homily? Well, first of all, in his private writings, we get hints that he may have actually written a homily. And also, this homily is basically just a shortened version of his 1535 treatise, De Vera Obedientia, which is all about submission to the magistrate, which is exactly what this homily is about, the language and themes and argumentation of his treatise and this homily are strikingly similar. So the two problematic passages in the first book of homilies were actually written, I argue, by Catholics who should not therefore determine how Anglicans should view the Apocrypha or what the Anglican position of the Apocrypha are. Now we come to the second book of homilies, which was very much written entirely by the evangelicals in the Church of England during the reign of Edward VI. First of all, in the second book of homilies, in one or two places, the apocryphal books are sort of described as being scriptural. That's actually just not an issue because, as we've already discussed, people like John Coson were happy to say that the apocryphal books can be given the name of Holy Scripture, even though, strictly speaking, they're not Holy Scripture. So, for instance, in the homily against the peril of idolatry, great homily, by the way, that totally debunks Nicaea too in the veneration of images, it talks about a principle and then it says this principle is expressed at large in the Scriptures namely the Psalms, the Book of Wisdom, the prophet Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Baruch. So that's just not an issue because these books can be given the name of Holy Scripture, even though they're not Holy Scripture, as John Coson has already talked about. However, there is one homily in the second book of homilies that does pose more of a problem, and Anglo-Catholics love to quote this passage all the time to Reformed Anglicans to prove that either the formularies are contradictory and therefore we shouldn't take them seriously, or that the formularies actually believe that the Apocrypha are canonical scripture. But of course, Article 6 actually explicitly says that they aren't canonical scripture. Now, first of all, this homily was almost certainly written by Bishop John Jewell. And we know that Bishop John Jewell did not actually consider the Apocrypha to be canonical scripture. So just bear that in mind when we get to this quotation. So this is in the homily of almsdeeds and mercifulness towards the poor 
and needy. First, the homily bases a lot of its teaching on what's found in the book of Tobit and the book of Ecclesiasticus. That's not a problem because, for instance, the homily of common prayer and sacraments is almost entirely based on the writings of St. Augustine alone, and you know no one considers those to be scriptures. So it's fine to base doctrine in some sense of uh, books that are not scriptural. But the homily talks about something, and then it says, the same lesson doth the Holy Ghost also teach in sundry places of Scripture, and then quotes Tobit chapter 4 verse 10 and Ecclesiasticus chapter 3 verse 30, which suggests that those two books are inspired by the Holy Ghost, which would therefore make them canonical. Now, at a stretch, I don't actually make this argument, but at a stretch, you could say, well, they're inspired by the Holy Ghost similar to how the Holy Ghost can inspire a wonderful sermon or a wonderful theological book or something. But again, that is definitely a stretch. Now, how do we resolve this issue and how do we make sense of it in light of the fact that who we think probably wrote this homily didn't actually believe the Apocrypha uh, canonical scripture? Well, the basic reason is because this passage in the homily is actually, practically speaking, entirely a quotation of St. Cyprian, and therefore does not necessarily reflect the actual views of the writer himself, and the writer has changed Cyprian's quotation in such a way that actually suggests that he doesn't agree with Cyprian. So let's compare the two texts. We'll compare this passage from the homily with the corresponding passage in St. Cyprian of Carthage's of works and arms, which the homily earlier on, by the way, had said the homily was actually drawing heavily from. So it's not like this is a coincidence. It's not like it's plagiarism. The homily has already said that it's drawing from Cyprian. We'll start with Cyprian. So Cyprian says, the Holy Spirit speaks in the sacred scriptures and says, by almsgiving and faith, sins are purged, which is a quote from Tobit chapter four. Now we'll look at the homily. The same lesson doth the Holy Ghost also teach in sundry places of Scripture, saying, Mercifulness and almsgiving purges from all sins. So, so right there, those two things are very much the same. This is basically a quote from Cyprian. Remember, this is, you know, Cyprian didn't write in English, so this is a translation of Cyprian. So I'm comparing what the homilies translation of Cyprian is to another English translation of Cyprian. So the wording isn't going to be exactly the same anyway. But whereas Cyprian, right after quoting Tobit 4, then moves on to another point in the homily, the homily then adds, right after Tobit 4, another quotation, this time taken from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. So whereas in Cyprian's original text, when he says the Holy Ghost says in Holy Scripture, he's just referring to Tobit. And the homily now, when it says the Holy Ghost doth teach in sundry places of scripture, it's now referring to Tobit and Proverbs. Now, why would the writer do this? Why would he actually add another quote into this quote from Cyprian? Well, maybe it's because he believes the apocryphal books can't stand on their own. They cannot be solely the infallible source of doctrine, but they can only support the canonical books. And that's why he's added in a canonical scriptural text into the quotation. Now back to the passage in Cyprian's book. Cyprian then says, moreover, the Holy Ghost says again, as water extinguishes fire, so almsgiving quenches sin, which is a quote from Sirach chapter 3 verse 30. But in the homily, however, he actually changes Cyprian's words. So whereas Cyprian says the Holy Ghost says, and then quotes Sirach, in the homily it says, the wise preacher, the son of Sirach, confirmeth the same when he saith, as water quencheth burning fire, even so mercy and arms resisteth and reconcileth sins. And so while Cyprian ascribes this quote from Sirach to the Holy Ghost, the homily now ascribes it just to the wise son of Sirach. So just to reiterate, Cyprian has this work of works and arms. Where he says the Holy Spirit teaches us so and so forth in Tobit and also in Sirach. The homily then basically quotes from Cyprian, which has already said it's doing, but changes it so that first of all, Sirach is split off from this whole the Holy Spirit says thing because that's actually a new sentence where he then says the wise son of Sirach confirmeth the same. So that's no longer coming under the category of the Holy Spirit says. 
which just leaves Tobit. But then the author of this homily adds Proverbs into the quotation from Cyprian so that Tobit's not standing on its own. And so then when he says the Holy Spirit says in, in the Holy Scriptures, that could just be referring to Proverbs, which is backed up by Tobit. But in any case, at this point, he's actually still just quoting Cyprian. So that's not necessarily reflective of his own views about Tobit. And so there's really just two possible ways to now interpret this data. Either you can read it where when it says the Holy Spirit says that does mean that Tobit is inspired by the Holy Spirit, sure. But even if that's the case, that doesn't necessarily mean the right of the homily thinks that since he's just quoting Cyprian. The other possibility is that you actually don't need to now interpret it that way because of how he's added in Proverbs. So I don't think that this passage is anywhere near as clear as Anglo-Catholics like to think it is. It cannot be used to say that the Anglican formularies believe the homilies are canonical scripture. We do have in the formularies in Article 6 a clear statement that the Apocrypha are not canonical scripture. And in the homilies, there are some vague things here and there, but they're just not enough to actually make us decide the article uh, isn't true or that the formularies contradict themselves. There's just not enough really to to base that belief on. So with that out of the way, if the homily is no longer really being as much of a problem as Anglo-Catholics try and make them out to be, that just leads us back to what I've been saying, which is that the standard Anglican view of the Apocrypha, at least in the first hundred years of Anglicanism, is that they are part of the canon of scripture. They are part of the canon of the Bible. They should be included in the Bible. They should be bound in your Bible. So if you're an Anglican watching this, you probably should have a Bible at home that has the apocryphal books in it. And I would highly recommend the King James Version if you get uh, the 1611 version of the King James Version or there's other versions online of it. Uh, they can actually include the apocryphal books in there. So you should be reading the Apocrypha. If you're following the lectionary of the Book of Common Prayer as I do, you will be reading the Apocrypha throughout the year. Uh, however, we don't think that they are inspired, infallible, God's breathed out words like the canonical books are. And I hate to say this because it's such a cliche and it's very often not true, but when it comes to the Apocrypha, the Anglican view is essentially a via media between Roman Catholicism and sort of, you know, contemporary Protestantism, where like most other Protestants, we do believe that the only the 66 books of the sort of standard Protestant canon are inspired scripture. But then like the Roman Catholics, we do actually have the apocryphal books in our Bibles and we do read them in the liturgy as part of uh, the lectionary. So in a sense that that really is like a via media position. But again, I, I do not agree that Anglicanism is a via media between Rome and uh, Protestantism. I don't think that at all. I think if anything, if we're a via media, it would be between Geneva and Wittenberg. We sort of uh, have Lutheran aspects, but mostly reformed aspects. But that's that's a conversation for another time. And of course, I have a video. Uh, I'll link it below about how Anglicanism is thoroughly Protestant. But yeah, we, we have an interesting view of the Apocrypha. It's definitely quite nuanced and I would argue is actually the patristic view and even is the view of many medieval theologians as John Coson argues very convincingly in the book that I've already discussed in this video. So that wraps it up. I hope that you found this video educational. I hope that you've uh, found it helpful as well. And what I would encourage you to do is to not get too worried about the Apocrypha when it comes up in apologetics, especially for Roman Catholics, where they'll say, well, you know, uh, the Apocrypha has always been included in the Bible in the early church. So how can you remove it from the canon and whatnot? Well, as Anglicans, we haven't removed it from the canon. But at the same time, we can also still stand by the fact that in the New Testament, the New Testament never quotes from the Apocrypha. And when the New Testament indicates what the canon of the Old Testament scriptures are, it very clearly excludes the Apocrypha from, from that. So, for instance, our Lord Jesus Christ says that everything must be fulfilled, which was written in the law, the Psalms, the prophets, which is the standard sort of three ways that the Jews would categorize the Hebrew scriptures. And that does not include the apocryphal books.
And Jesus also talks about the span of time from Abel to Zacharias, which in Judaism at the time was often seen as sort of being the boundaries of the canon. You have Abel, that sort of Genesis, to the death of Zacharias, which is the closing of the Hebrew canon. So, uh, I yeah, we can actually kind of agree with the Roman Catholics when they say, well, who are you to just take the Apocrypha out of the canon if the early church always sort of had it in there? We agree. Sure, we don't think you should take out the canon. In fact, the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, in 1615, said that you'll go to prison for a year if you do that. Uh, but then we agree with uh, with Protestants, and we are Protestants, but we agree with other Protestants when they say, look, there's no actual basis in the New Testament itself to view the Apocrypha as Scripture. And the Apocrypha do have some sort of uh, odd verses in there and some weird things that sort of make it seem like maybe we shouldn't be uh, taking them as seriously as we take the canonical books. So don't get so worried about this stuff as an Anglican. I think we're actually, we're actually in a really happy position here, a happy medium here where you can very you can be very comfortable with the canon of Scripture. And I would recommend that you read the Apocrypha. They are great books. They do help you to understand what happened between the Old and New Testament. And there are some really edifying teachings uh, to be found in there as well. So again, I hope you found this video educational. Hope you found it helpful. And God bless you.